I've been teaching for literally, this is my 44th year doing this. And in those 44 years, I've worked in 150 countries around the world, not all 195, but 150. And I've worked with people from every country, obviously. I've seen every culture. One of the things that you start seeing when you're around people that much, you have all these experiences, you start seeing these patterns. And one of the most important patterns is frankly the energy you have. So right now you're in your homes and like, you know, when we first started this, I did this last July and I, I had this experience, probably like many of you. And I gotta tell you, I didn't deal with it well. I don't want you to think I'm some superhuman and I was just like, oh, this is easy. It wasn't like that at all. This is my mission. I got all these companies, that's one thing. But this work is what I live for, it's what I've made for. And when all of a sudden I remember I had this big birthday party for my 60th birthday and I said, I don't want to party. And then I got everybody to agree that we'd make a party to raise money for Underground Railroad, which is one of my favorite charities that saves children. And you know, right now we have more children enslaved around the world than any time in history. It's insane. That's it was your child. So we raised 14 million, I added 5 million. It was quite a birthday. And I was like, wow, 19 million bucks. We're going to save 25,000 children's lives. Children that are praying right now, that someone's going to rescue them and their prayers are going to be heard. I was just overwhelmed with so much joy and, and grace tears. And the next day, in the middle of this high, somebody called me up and said, hey, are you going to cancel your Unleash the Power Within event up in San Francisco, up in San Jose? And I was like, last year I was in Australia. I got mercury poisoning. It burned a hole in my esophagus. I lost a third of my blood supply, almost died. And the doctor says, you're here for four days. I said, I'm in the middle of the seminar. I'm going. He goes, you can't go. I said, you can't keep me here. So we finally made a deal. I got a wheelchair and I finished my seminar there in Australia. That's how committed I am, so you get a sense. I said, cancel the event. Are you insane? And then two days later, California state government said, nothing more than 100 people. And we had 12,500 people there. And so we had canceled. Then all of a sudden they canceled us in Amsterdam and in London and in Sydney, Australia. Literally all over the earth it started happening. So what do you do when everything you believe in, everything you're about, everything in your family is suddenly is disrupted? Well, a lot of people just get really, really pain, a lot of pain in their body. In fact, if you know anything about death, there's these cycles of how to deal with death that people describe, the stages that are pretty universal. And as I look back on it now, I can see how I went through those stages, and I'm wondering if you did. The first stage when you have a deep loss, like when there's a death, when something ends, the first one is just shock. Like, what? Someone said, are you kidding me? That's not possible. And that's what happened when they called and said, we're canceling all events around the world, everything you do, people need me the most, now I got the tools. It's not ego, I know I can help because I've done it for 44 years in 150 countries. It's like, these people need this now and they're gonna keep me from doing this, it's insane. So first there was just shock, then the second stage you usually go to is anger or frustration. And I was like, so frustrated. How many can relate? How many went through some of these stages yourself? Total shock when they told you you're gonna send your kids home, gonna keep you home, shut down your restaurant. What? Right? And then anger, and then what happens? Out of the anger, you, you, you can't solve it, so now you start to bargain. Some of you bargain with God. When I was bargaining with God, I was bargaining with governors in other states saying, Vegas, we'll go to Vegas, we'll just move everything to Vegas. They're never going to shut down Vegas. And they shut down Las Vegas. We'll go to Texas. Texas is its own country in America, practically. They're never going to shut it down. The governor says, we'll never shut it down. I see some Texans out there smiling, right? And so, but he shut it down. It's like, okay, but we can't do it any place in the world. Fine. They won't let us do more than 30 people at that point. It was 30 to 50 and they just kept shrinking it. We'll do it in movie theaters. I'll get a thousand movie theaters, right? And we'll put like, you know, 20 people in each one. We'll get 20,000 people. And then they shut down movie theaters. Then they said to me, oh, all right, we're gonna go to churches. They're not gonna shut down churches. You can't do that. You can't have Costco be open and close a church, but they did. So then I was left with, what do you do? Well, I could give up. I'm not about to do that. The bargaining didn't work, so then I went through the next stage. Sadness. How many went through a place of sadness or even almost a feeling of depression? Raise your hand. So you go through that stage and it's like, oh my God, it's a sense of loss. It's a sense of sadness. It's like, oh my God, the world is the world as we know it over. And the only way you get out of that 
And it's not, it's not part of being an achiever. Most of us out there, how many of you consider yourself to be an achiever? Part of your identity is I find a way, I make shit happen. Look, you're almost everybody, right? Well, if you're an achiever, you don't just accept things. And so, but the problem is, there's a formula for, for suffering, not for stress, but for suffering. And that formula is, you get some massive stress that comes in that you can't control, and then you fight it. The more you fight it, the more stress you have. You have to step into a different mode that's not part of most of us are on this, this virtual room we're doing this in together. And that is, you gotta accept it. Not accept that it's right or it's fair, but accept it is what it is and I gotta deal with it. There's a lot of people that are just a something. There's very few people that are the something, okay? So when I, when people introduce myself as a trainer, I'm like, no, I'm not a trainer, I'm the trainer. It's a huge difference. So self-doubt, worry, procrastination, overthinking, analysis paralysis, fear, those are all thinking patterns that are habits. One of the most important things that I want people to understand is that you're actually not a worrier. You have a habit of a big difference. You're not a procrastinator. You have a habit of procrastinating. Big difference. Every one of those behavior patterns and thinking patterns can actually be interrupted and replaced using science. You can use a simple trick the moment you feel yourself hesitate, the moment you've got one of those moments where you know that you need to, this is that moment that Lewis talks to you about where you got to step outside of your comfort zone and you've got to lean into your passion and you've got to really take some risks and you got to feel the fear and you got to do it anyway. That's the moment where you just woke up and now you got a decision to make. Are you going to drift back into the habits or are you going to awaken your prefrontal cortex and drive forward and focus and do something new? Success does not require you to look out the window. It only requires that you look in the mirror. To be successful, you don't have to look out the window and, oh, where is my help? Where are the people that I need? All you got to do is stop, look directly in the mirror, and the one person you need to blow up, the one person you need to be successful is looking right back at you. And if you're willing to make a commitment to that person in the mirror, if you're willing to look at that person in the mirror and say, I'll make a commitment to you from this day forward, that whatever it takes, I'll do whatever it takes. Whatever it is you want to accomplish or whatever it is you want to do, you literally have to see it first. If you're not trying to get out of your shitty situation and every day you're choosing to stay in it, and you can't complain about being given the choice you keep making. You know, I, I, one of my favorite quotes is, um, change happens when the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of making a change. You know what's so funny? We want people to make guarantees to us, but we're not willing to make guarantees to ourselves. You gotta know what you're good at. You gotta know what you're marginal at, and you gotta know what you suck at. And you've gotta find people who complement your skills. You know, and you gotta know what type of thinker you are. You gotta know how you work, you know. And once you start to understand who you are, then you can start finding places where you'll be successful and you won't be you won't be lying to yourself. You can have any habits you want to have. You can be you can be lazy, you can be prompt, you can be you can be late, you can be honest, you can cut corners. I mean, you have all these choices. And those are choices for you to make. Nobody else is going to make them for you. And I would suggest that you play this little game with me, too. Uh, think about the person you would most like to be in life. So maybe it's one of your contemporaries, maybe it's somebody a little older. But pick out the person you admire the most, the person that you change places with, if you could. And then write down why you admire them. Just put it on a piece of paper. And then figure out the person that you would least like to change places with you, who really turns you off, who you find repulsive. And list the reasons why that person 
turns you off so much. And then look at that list. And you'll find that everything on the left-hand side, what you admire in other people, the qualities they bring to life, you'll find those are things you can do yourself. It's very simple. You gotta apply yourself, but the habits you form in doing that early on will carry you through life. If you do that, two or three years from now, if you go through the same exercise, you'll find out that the person you admire the most is yourself. You have only one life, so don't waste it. It's a big dream, you know, and so uh, my job was to clean these seven floors between Friday and Sunday. So every time I would go to the, the seventh floor was the CEO office. So I would bust in like I was the CEO. I'm doing it like I'm the CEO now. And who would have ever thought I've been blessed? And here I am, I am the CEO of my own company. Well, I think that the, the number one thing is you have to have a very clear vision, a very clear goal of where you want to go. Because only then you will get there. Uh, you can have the best airplane or the best ship in the world, but if the captain doesn't know where to go, he will just drift around. If the pilot does not know where to go, he will just drift around with his plane. So it's, I think the key thing is that we know where we are going and that you're very passionate about that. Maybe you see it always in front of you, the goal. To thrive in whatever you do, please understand your terrain. Know what your target is. Don't guess it. Be as clued up as the next man, because that's, that's, that's your petrol, that's your, 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 your fuel to get you moving. If you don't know where you're going, what your targets are, you're never going to get there, period. And the other thing that's important is, is that you got to shoot for the top. You got to go and really have big goals and think big because then you're going to get big. Then you're going to go and achieve big things. That is the most important thing. You know, you don't achieve big things by accident. We are controlled by what we focus on and what things mean. But the problem is most of us have been conditioned and we let the world and the environment train us to think like everybody else. And listen, you and I both know, I'm not, I'm not into positive thing. I'm into the truth. I'm into intelligence. I'm into seeing it as is, but not worse than it is. I'm into seeing it better than it is. So there's a vision. Otherwise you have no direction. And then I'm into doing what it takes to turn it around. See, You've got to control the meaning. If you control the meaning, you have an extraordinary life. But if you let the media, external people, then you'll be a follower. And most people, you tell me, are most Americans healthy, vital, strong, healthy? Are most Americans in a passionate relationship for decades where they don't just hang out, they love each other and want to be with each other? Do most people have a career or a job or a company that they love, can't wait to go to every day? You know, the answer is most people, the answer is no, but there's a few who do. And I mentioned a few who do versus the many who talk. And then finally, the third decision is what are you going to do? Because what you're going to do is different than if your meaning is they're dissing me, than if your meaning is they're challenging me, than if your meaning is they're loving on me. Make sense? And so it's important to learn to find empowering meanings, to train yourself to focus on what you have, what, instead of what's missing, what you can do, what you can do this moment, what you can do in the future. Those are just a couple samples. And if you do that, you're gonna be in a state where you're gonna know what to do or you're gonna learn what to do quickly. And if you don't know what to do, trust your gut and take some kind of action. You go, what if it's the wrong action? You'll find out quicker and you can change again. But if you sit on the fence doing nothing, it'll just create frustration or fear and anxiety. So as you go through your graduation today, remember, it's in your moments of decision that your destiny is shaped. So choose well. And as you do, choose in a way where you're kind to yourself and kind to others and where you trust that there's something in you larger than your mind. There's a spirit and soul inside you that can guide you. You can ask for that guidance and you can trust in that guidance 
And that does not mean you're always going to make the right choice. But it does mean that you can learn from everything. And in the end, life's not about just being happy, right? The moment, if you're happy all the time, your face hurts. <laughs> you ever smiled so much for so much, your face hurts? We need balance. What we really need is a life of meaning. And that's a life where it's not just about you. It's a life of service. If you can find something or someone that you care so much for, you'll do anything for them, then the greatest part of you will come out. It could be a mission for your community. It could be for the world. It could be your family. It could be your friends. It could be your lover. It could be anything. It could be in the future, maybe your children. But if you can find something you care about more than yourself, you're not going to suffer. Because in the end, there's only two options, suffer or grow. If you're suffering, you haven't grown yet. And so grow into a new set of beliefs that take you beyond the focus of limitation to what's truly possible. So congratulations. This is a beautiful day, even though it may be challenging in all kinds of ways. Remember, you know, we're the opponent what creates a great hero. And you've got a great story to write in the life of your life. You've already written a beautiful story to start with. But I really trust and send prayers and faith and love that you have created the most compelling future possible and that you build a life that is truly magnificent on your terms. Lead, don't follow. God bless and live with passion. If this body is dying and you can make peace with that, is, it, is this you? Is this who you really are? And then it opens up the question, who are you really? Are you this body? This body every seven years changes. You know, the cells change every seven years, regenerate. So literally after seven years, you have a totally different body, a totally different cellular structure. Technically, you are a different person. And so are you just this body? Are you just your past? Are you just your memory? Are, you know, what am I? Who am I? And so I think this is the question. And so for me, death, the real death is not just the death of this physical body, because I believe that what we are is not just this body. We are something more than this physical body. Uh, I think the real death is the letting go of the attachment and the identification of this conditioned sense of self that we have learned to be based on our past, based on our experiences, based on our childhood, based on our conditioning, based on what our parents told us, you're this kind of person, you're not this kind of person, you'll, you know, you'll never make it, you're stupid, you're amazing, you're great, you're, you're not good at math, you're not a creative person. And so we identify with these thought forms and we identify with these belief systems and then we hold tightly onto this sense of, you know, identification as a sense of me. And so really, I like to question people and ask you, like, is who you are, who you really are? Do you look at a child? A child is in touch with his innocence. A child is in touch with his or her aliveness. It's, it will dance naked. It's not thinking, am I fat? What do you think? You know, it's just, it's just, that's freedom. You know, that's liberation. That's freedom. They're in touch with, you know, I like to call it the divine, you know, their essence, their soul. There's a free expansiveness that they're in touch with. But what happens? You know, we're born into a world where we meet our parents. You know, and our parents, they're just doing the best that they can do based on their past and their conditioning and their childhood and their traumas and just their life. And so we're born into this experience. And as children, we learn two things. The first thing is we learn all sorts of ways, often unconsciously, out of survival to shut down, disconnect, not feel. Not feel the pain of, my dad's an alcoholic. Not feel the pain of, my dad is not around. Not feel the pain of my mother's, my mother's crazy or my parents are screaming all the time. As children, we're very sensitive to this. And so we learn all sorts of ways to shut down our feeling capacity to disconnect. And we start suppressing, suppressing our feeling and our emotion and our sensitivity just to ultimately function and survive. And then we learn all sorts of ways to sort of go into the world. Me personally, I became the preacher's kid. I became the nice guy. I became the perfect son, I, the perfect person who couldn't make any mistakes. I became the responsible one, which was the over-responsible one. So we learned to develop all of these roles, you know, that we, we kind of suppress our feelings and our pain and we develop all these roles to ultimately 
function and survive so we contort ourselves into a certain shape to avoid pain to get love and validation and approval we contort ourselves into a certain shape and then we identify with the shape that we've become thinking this is just who i am and now we're so identified with this as me but it's simply a conditioned sense of self and so the more tightly we're holding on to this way of being because maybe it worked for us when we were five it worked for us when we were eight it worked for us when we were 10 but maybe it doesn't work for us when we're 22 or 25 or 27 or 30 or whatever the age is you know so often what worked for us when we were younger doesn't work for us as we're older and so i think the degree to which we're identified as the sense of self is inhibits our sense of freedom inhibits our sense uh, our ability many people we feel like that we have so much potential you know i think there's many folks listening and that they feel we feel like god there's so much i want to give there's so much i want to love there's so much i want to do and express but it doesn't get out because it's trapped inside of this sort of identification and these patterns of conditioning so for me i think one of the things that keeps us stuck on a, in a simple level uh, are all the ways we lie to ourselves you know all the ways we bullshit ourselves all the ways we don't tell the truth to ourselves all the ways we rationalize you know uh you know i'm in a relationship and it, it, it's not so bad it, it's okay i should be grateful you know i and, and, the, and the truth is we know it's not aligned or maybe someone's working a job that they deeply hate inside where they're compromising their integrity but they're they're afraid of how am i going to survive if i'm really honest and what it takes today to live a healthy a long and healthy life um it's so multifaceted uh and nutrition is definitely it plays a major a major role in that regard but it's just one part of the puzzle and so whereas genius foods my first book i consider to be sort of the ultimate nutritional care manual for the human brain um, having a brain that functions as well as it ought to requires a lot more than just healthy eating today, unfortunately. I mean, I wish it was as easy as eating, you know, a handful of blueberries and wild salmon and, uh, you know, some nuts here and there. But actually, you know, the modern world is sort of like the Hunger Games for, for the human brain. And I know you love the movie references. And uh, we're just like, we're being attacked from every which way, from, you know, the the industrial chemicals which we are confronted with on a daily basis, many of which we've we've been exposed to for the entirety of our lives, to the fact that you know leisure time physical activity is at an all time low, to the fact that our food supply has become saturated with ultra processed foods, to the fact that our circadian clocks are completely out of whack. So the genius life, I really explore all of the facets of what it takes to live uh, healthy. I include nutrition and diet as well. Um, but it's really packed with sort of the, the little changes that you can make in your day-to-day -day life that are going to have big wins in terms of your health. Mm. When you were doing the research, what was something that really surprised you? Well, I think it was kind of, uh, you know, it, it was scary the degree to which um, the odds are stacked against the average human. And, and that was very eye-opening. But it was also simultaneously... What stacks the odds against us? Well, just the fact that you know, whether it's access to healthy food or air pollution or, you know, the industrial chemicals that we use to clean or even create our domiciles, you know, our, our homes. Um, we're just, we're inundated with, with exposures that are not doing our biology any favors. Um, so those are the, that's what I mean. I mean, today, uh, it's, it's frightening when you look around, you see people that are, you know, struggling with overweight, with being obese. 66% um, of the population is either overweight or obese. Half of the population is either pre-diabetic or has type 2 diabetes, which we know both of those conditions is actually a late marker for chronically elevated insulin or hyperinsulinemia, mm -hmm. um, which can go on for years, if not decades, before your blood sugar actually starts to inch up, you know, to a degree that a doctor would measure it. Um, so, you know, people are not well, um, if you live to the age of 85, you have a one in two chance of being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Um, certain cancers are increasing in their frequency. In the 1960s, a woman's lifetime risk of developing breast cancer uh, was one in 20. Today, it's about one in eight. 
So there's obviously been a mutation in our environments. Our genes haven't changed all that much. And yet the default state for any organism is health. But you look around and people are not healthy, people are not feeling well. When you look in the mirror, I mean, I want your listeners to kind of introspect for a minute and ask whether or not you feel healthy, whether or not you feel virile and vital and well. And I wrote this book and I became obsessed with, with this topic and really communicating this message to any anybody who will listen ultimately because my mom was so sick. Mm. And I feel in many ways that she was the canary in the coal mine for the modern way of life. I never look at it as investments, believe it or not. Uh, I just look at it as partnerships, help changing the world, and just being part of something that's inspiring. My business people all the time, whenever they talk about money, you can ask them, ah, I don't want to hear it. But if they bring an idea to me that I think is going to go to the next level, most of the time if I follow my heart, and everything else will fall in place. I've never ever done a deal, a we got this suit company, we throw some pinstripes in the suit, you give me a hundred thousand, we sell 20 of them, we make, I've never did a deal where it was always based on money. I've always did my business deals based on how I felt it was gonna go in the future, how I felt it was gonna help and inspire somebody. If I look at what Amazon was able to do 20 years ago, we didn't have to build a transportation network. It already existed. That heavy lifting was in place. We didn't have to build a payment system. That heavy lifting had already been done. It was the credit card system. We didn't have to build, um, put a computer on every desk. That had already been done too, mostly for playing games, by the way, and so on. So all the pieces of heavy lifting were already in place 20 years ago. And that's why, as a, with a million dollars, I could start this company. Today, you know, and, and then there are even better examples on the internet over the last 20 years. You know, uh, Facebook started in a dorm room. Uh, I guarantee you two kids cannot build a giant space company in their dorm room. Don't be so con concerned about what you're going to do with those people, but you want to, you know, the joint brain is, you know, there's nothing the joint brain, collective brain, or brains can't overcome. And I give the example of the, uh, atomic bomb, Manhattan Project, and they were put together uh, and they were told we need, uh, we need to develop a weapon of mass destruction, which they didn't call it that back in those days, uh, in the middle 40s, to end the war in the Pacific. Uh, and they did. They didn't know if it was implode or explode, but they did. But if, you're, if, if your team doesn't look like that, then you should, I won't say you should give serious thought, you should just change. How much exposure is it? Like Tyler will tell you, sitting right here, one of the only times I still do free work is if it's massive exposure. There are 49,000 people in the audience. I'm like, oh, it's a lot of exposure. You know, like, <laughs> like it's live on, you know, it's during the Super Bowl. Like, like I'll pay somebody to put me in a Super Bowl commercial, right? Like it, when, they, when, when I get exposure or, and that's where I'm at now, in the, for you, when you pick these five restaurants, let it be the biggest restaurants in your 30 mile radius. Let it be the kindest. Let it be somebody who has the biggest Instagram following and maybe like whether, you, you know, you never want to give with expectation, but it's, it's okay to ask. You're like, hey, I'd love to sharpen your knives for free. The nature of capitalism is that people want to come in and take your capsule. Perfectly understand. I mean, it might be selling television sets or something. There's going to be 10 other people who are going to try and sell a better television set. If I have a restaurant here in Omaha, People are gonna try and copy my menu and do more parking and take my chef and so on. So capitalism's all about somebody coming and trying to take the castle. Now what you need is you need a castle that has some durable competitive advantage, some castle that has a moat around it. And that moat, that's one of the best moats in many respects is to be a low cost producer. But sometimes the moat is just having more talent. I mean, if you're the heavyweight champion of the world and you keep knocking out people, you've got a competitive advantage as long as you can keep doing it. And it's very profitable uh, if you're the one that happens to be able to do it. If you can turn out great motion pictures, I mean, you know, Steven Spielberg, I mean, he, he, he's a fellow to bet on and, and it has enormous economic value. There's two sides of pain that I don't think a lot of people really understand. Right? There's, there's one side of pain that's the suffering and the discomfort side of pain. That's why everybody raised their hands when I first asked, do you have everybody ever been through pain? Because that hurts. You remember what that felt like. But then there's another side of pain. 
That's called effort. It's called glory. It's called if you can find a way to push through pain, there's something greater on the other side of it. And, 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 and if you never tap into it, it's because the first time you felt it, you backed off. The first time you felt ah, that burn, the first time you felt that ah, it, it's too much. But now, don't get me wrong, there's days I wanted to quit, a lot of days. I almost drove back to Cleveland several times and just gave up, but... You know, man, your dreams have to be bigger than all your fears. If you get... See, that's why you have to have big dreams. Because your dreams have to be bigger than all your fears and all your consequences. What makes people go back is you dream too small. See, your problem in life ain't if you aim too high and you miss it. Your problem in life is if you aim, aim too low and you hit it. That's what you messed up now. So when you aim to the moon and you miss, you still amongst the stars. So it kind of keeps you motivated a lot longer, man, to help you push through. Because everybody's gonna have to have a push through moment. Because everybody has a turn back moment. The key to making it is you can never turn back. See, God is always coming. And we rationalize with ourselves to where we automatically stop. That's why a bunch of us give up so much in life so quickly. That's why kids have a problem finishing things a few days. Because as soon as they feel a small bit of discomfort or things ain't right, oh, they're gone. I can't do it no more. But suppose I told you the greatest pain of my life is the reason I'm standing here today. Suppose I was able to share with you. My routine was so crazy, man. I was seeing almost nine doctors for nine weeks. 6 a.m. 2 a.m. every morning. 10 days. 10 days from tricep repair surgery. I had my bike flew out. I flew my bike out. I got on my bicycle. I cycle a lot. I got on my cycle. I got on my bike. And I tried to grip the bar. And I couldn't grip it. Didn't have enough strength. And I sat there for 30 minutes until I made up in my mind, stop crying and grip the handle. Just grab the bag. See, look, man, when you ask God for something, God boxes it up, put your name on it, and he ships it the day you ask for it. As soon as you ask for it, he ships it. The problem with the package is he never tells you the date that it's going to arrive. If he did that, it would destroy the one element that he requires, your faith. So God sends your package, but he only delivers to Faith Street. If you step off of Faith Street and you go over here to I Don't Believe It Boulevard, he don't ship that. If you step over here to I Don't See How Avenue, he don't ship that. If you step over here to Ain't No Way Circle, he don't ship that. The package only goes to Faith Street. What happens to the average person is, that when the package arrived and you ain't on Faith Street, it's just like the post office and FedEx, UPS. If you ain't there, the package got to go back. You know how many packages you got in heaven with your name on it that got sent back? This is real talk, man. This is, this is how it works. Being successful, y'all, is not a magic trick. Uh, a couple of things kept me going. Most of it was messages that I had learned from my mother. But I learned something about faith. Faith comes from hearing, not from having heard. My mother was telling me those messages years ago. But during my homeless years, I would rehear them 
and that's when it mattered. And I had this such a grand dream and vision. I was willing to push through to see what the vision was going to be, to see if I could get to the dream. And I kept hearing my mother say words like, God didn't bring you this far to leave you. So I said, okay, well, maybe he ain't left me. Let me just see if I can wake up tomorrow, something to change. You know, then I kept hearing stuff like faith is the belief in things that you cannot see. Or say, okay, cool. So I don't see nothing but this homelessness right now, but I think I'm going to make it one day. And I just kept going, man. I just kept. Now, now, now don't get me wrong. Those days I wanted to quit a lot of days. I almost drove back to Cleveland several times and just gave up. But, you know, man, your dreams have to be bigger than all your fears. If you get, see, that's why you have to have big dreams. Because your dreams have to be bigger than all your fears and all your consequences. What makes people go back is you dream too small. See, your problem in life ain't if you aim too high and you miss it. Your problem in life is if you lay aim too low and you hit it. That's, you messed up now. So when you aim to the moon and you miss, you steal amongst the stars. So it kind of keeps you motivated a lot longer, man, to help you push through. Because everybody's going to have to have a push through moment. Because everybody has a turn back moment. The key to making it is you can never turn back. See, sometimes we think the pain is what controls us. It's actually our subconscious mind. That if we ever tapped into that, that's what dictates most of our lives. And I'm sitting there and I said, just squeeze it. And I squeezed it. Ten days out. And I started riding the bike ten days out. Because see, pain, pain is tricky. Because if you don't control pain, it'll control you. And so that's where my psyche started to change because I, look, it was already in my mind that I was coming back. But listen to what I had to hear about all of the people who had everything to say about my career was on. Every TV station, every ESPN channel, Sad news. Ray Lewis' career is over. And I'm saying, wow! That many people can dictate if I'm coming back or not? That many people got control over what I do from this point forward going forward. That many people can tell me. Man, I heard one, one comment say this. One of the greatest warriors of all time. And we lose him like this. So I said, oh my gosh. He done wrote me off. I said, I might as well pack it up. But think about, think about what we do the moment we feel that, right? That's back to the two sides of fake, the, the two sides of pain. See, at that point, I feel like a victim. And I feel like, oh man, why me? You know, and Dang it, dang it, dang it. Then after the first day I rode my bike, I came back. I failed, I failed twice. When I failed, I remember laying on the ground. And I said, Lou, ain't nobody out here gonna help you get up. What makes you get up when you fall down? What makes your mentality change if there's a great situation or there's a bad situation? How do you dictate that based off the level of pain? Because I think that's what we're getting in trouble at. And so when I started cycling, when I started going to see these doctors, I realized that I turned my greatest pain into my greatest achievement. I don't have no education. I'm not really like uh, school smart, none of that. Now I got a lot of people who work for me, got degrees. See, when I don't, when I don't know something, I, I pay somebody to know it. Just come stay around it. I come down here and do the gift. I keep telling the jokes. I'm telling you, God has an incredible life for you. All you gotta do is ask him for it. 
be willing to put in the work. But now this work part is hard. Success is hard. But let me ask you a question. Ain't not being successful hard too? So now which hard you want? You want the hard with some options and some benefits, or you want the hard when ain't nothing going on? I'm going to take the hard with the option and benefits. Give me that hard. Let me try that.